All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's program. Jiro Yamada is a Japanese career diplomat who believes the best service an overseas mission can provide is connecting goodwill people with partners across borders. That sounds like Rotary to me. His work has spanned Moscow, Brussels, Warsaw, New York, and Nairobi. He has been Consul General of Japan in Seattle since 2017, and during that time has joined us as a fellow Rotarian. So Jiro, thank you so much for gathering this program and advanced uh, Dorothy Bullitt for, there you are over here, and Dorothy Bullitt for leading the panel. So come on up. Thank you, Sue. Good afternoon. Overall, I am very happy with the uh, close business and cultural ties between Seattle and Japan. So why am I addressing the Seattle Rotary today in a program focused on International Women's Day? That is because behind the success, there are many untold personal tragedies. It was our office's attorney, Ms. Naoko Inoue Shatz, who is here uh, in the audience today, who brought to me, who brought to my attention the plight of many Japanese women whose marriages end in divorce in Washington state. Close to half of all marriages end up in divorce, so divorce itself is no surprise. But these immigrant women are particularly vulnerable. When faced with domestic violence, they cannot defend themselves to police officers because they do not speak English as well as their spouse. These foreign spouses do not have family or social network in this country. Economically, they are usually totally dependent upon their husbands, and they have little knowledge about their rights or procedures under US law. During such divorces, it is all too often that the husband manipulates the wife and succeeds in abandoning the wife and children without giving financial support. The wife may be better off if she goes back to Japan, but she cannot do so because the children are often forced to stay in the United States by a court order. The mother struggles uh, in poverty with kids to look after. This story is widespread, not just among Japanese, but also women of many other nationalities. You can imagine that some of these women have to sell themselves to support their children. Please think about the effect on the children's development if they see their caring mother constantly depressed, desperate, and destitute. Please imagine yourselves in a similar situation. What you are imagining is a reality for many foreign wives here in Washington State. As Seattle is attracting an ever-increasing number of people from abroad, this problem is actually getting more serious. Still, I have high hopes that Washington State will face the challenge and take proactive measures, because the many political, judiciary, and military leaders that I have met with have voiced strong support of our initiative in a truly Washingtonian spirit. I want to thank the many leaders who are present here today, including the Honorable uh, Bobby Bridge, uh, the retired Supreme Court Judge, and Mr. John Bridge. And thanks again to the Rotary Club for giving us this opportunity to think about this issue together. Now the video, please. What should have been a happy life in Washington State became a nightmare for a Japanese woman we'll call Emmy, who married an American military serviceman. With each deployment, they grew further apart. 
Her husband only gave her a $600 monthly allowance for her and their two young sons. She told us through an interpreter she often went hungry so she could buy diapers. For example, you know, I didn't know how to go to a bank to open a bank account. I was so, so worried about money every day. While Emmy tried to maintain a happy face, her world was crumbling. She found out her husband was having an affair. She said he demanded a divorce and tried to force her to sign online divorce papers that provided no alimony or child support. When she refused, he took her to the police station and told officers she had threatened him with a knife. It was extremely terrifying experience. I was interrogated by the policeman. However, there is no Japanese interpreter, nobody who helps me. Emmy finally revealed her situation to a friend who introduced her to Naoko Inoue Schatz, an attorney who speaks Japanese. When my client um, called me on the phone, I was afraid she might commit suicide. Schatz works as a legal consult to the Consulate General of Japan. She says she receives 200 inquiries every year about divorce or domestic violence. And it's not just an issue for Japan. As I talked to uh, my colleagues uh, in the consular corps, I uh, came to understand that this is a really se serious problem. Last year, Japanese Consul General Yoichiro Yamada and Schatz lobbied the state legislature on behalf of divorced or abused immigrant women. They are in need of uh, food, they are in need of shelter, they are in need of money. The state provided $125,000 to start the International Families Justice Coalition. The access to uh, linguistically competent and uh, culturally sensitive legal service, that is what they are lacking. Schatz was able to help Emmy negotiate a fair divorce with maintenance and child support. I'm very happy. And Schatz is happy that through the IFJC, other immigrant wives have access to culturally appropriate legal advice. We have Korean-speaking attorney, Chinese-speaking attorney, Spanish-speaking attorney, Russian-speaking attorney, and um, Japanese-speaking attorney. Thank you, Lori Matsukawa and Mark Wright, uh, for that uh, video. And thank you, Jiro, for your compelling introduction to the sub subject and to, for your work in this uh, area since you arrived here in Seattle uh, a year and a half ago. Who in the room read the article in the Seattle Times today about a wife, an American woman, married to a Saudi man who lives in Saudi Arabia and was divorced and facing many of the challenges that Jiro just referred to? You see that in today's paper. So we, we feel empathy for the, this American woman uh, abroad, and we hear stories about that happening in other countries, well, it's also happening right here in Seattle. So our objective today is to um, inform you a bit about the problem that exists in every neighborhood in our community, to consider ways that this problem is being addressed by uh, various nonprofits in the area, and then suggest ways that we as citizens or residents of this area might uh, help to uh, uh, solve the problem, in, at least in a small way, like the child throwing the starfish back into the sea. Our panelists represent the voices of immigrant spouses from Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Asia. They will focus on the plight of spouses with nowhere to turn, the resources these immigrant spouses require, the role that their particular nonprofit organizations are playing in addressing the problems faced by immigrant spouses in crisis. An example of, of an immigrant spouse in crisis occurs to me that the this story last week about uh, the, the massage parlor in Florida where a Mr. Kraft was, uh, was arrested. Some of those women probably were originally immigrant spouses. Our plan panelists include uh, Joanne Alcaterra, 
the executive director of API Chaya, which strives to end violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, and domestic violence in the South Asian, Asian, and Pacific Islander communities in our region. Malu Chavez, Chavez, an attorney and the deputy director of the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, and Alice Bagarova, a volunteer attorney for the International Families Justice Coalition, who uh, focuses her volunteer work on serving Ukrainian and Russian women, and perhaps occasional Russian man who is being abused by an uh, American wife. Um, IFJC focuses on the challenges faced by all immigrant wives from, uh, and spouses from around the world. Our program will, will uh, be a structured conversation, and it will conclude with a summary and a call for action, and then there should be plenty of time for questions and answers from you. So as you're listening, keep in mind questions that might, you'd like to pose. So Joanne, maybe you could start us off. Uh, would you please describe some of the most serious challenges facing your clients at uh, API Chaya? Sure. An Thank example, you so much. it would be great too. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to share too is that our organization, API Chaya, was uh, founded because of several domestic violence-related homicides that happened here in Washington State. Um, and one of them, the most well-known, happened here at the King County Courthouse, just less than a mile away from here. There were three Filipino women, all who um, were born in the Philippines, uh, spoke the same dialect, and found friendship here in the United States as one of them was seeking a divorce from a very abusive spouse. And as they were helping her, um, they came together at the King County Courthouse, and all three of them were gunned down by that abusive spouse. Um, and that shook this community um, to its very core and uh, spurred the creation of our agency. And part of that um, creation was an understanding that domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking were um, co-occurring in a lot of the survivors that we were seeing. So I just want to give a shout out. We have here um, Judy Chen, who was one of our first executive directors. Um, former Representative Velma Veloria, who helped pass the trafficking legislation here in Washington State, which um, which was the first in the country to make um, human trafficking illegal. Um, and Dr. Satapa Basu from the UW Women's Center who um, created the first human trafficking conference here. And all of us partnered together in order to serve these survivors that we were seeing had no access to resources in other places. Um, one of our most recent client stories is um, we had a Chinese uh, client who spoke Cantonese whose husband um, was abusing her and her children and kept them um, in a very rural setting in a cabin with no running water um, and uh, um, no electricity. And uh, part of the abuse was that isolation. So she had no access to her cultural community. She had no access to anybody who spoke her language. And the only way that she ended up being referred to us was that she suffered a really severe trauma and had to be taken to the hospital and the referral happened there. Thank you. Malu, what are some of the more serious challenges facing some of your clients at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project? And with an example, if you have one. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and just give you a, a little background as to what our services are. Um, we have three focus areas. Um, one of them is providing legal services in the immigration context. So we see uh, clients who already potentially have suffered uh, the violence and then approach Northwest Immigrant Rights Project for the legal services. Um, we also focus on systemic advocacy to potentially change policies and practices across the U.S. And the third focus area is to provide community education. And, and so as to our legal services, um, we serve clients who are seeking to maintain their immigration status or obtain immigration status. And in this context, I'll focus on one particular unit in the Seattle office. We provide services across Washington State through four offices, but I'll focus on 
the VAWA unit, which is the Survivors of Crime unit um, in our Seattle office. And we, some of the challenges we, we see that our clients face vary, um, and it varies depending on the relief that they're seeking and, and, and what their potential desire of an outcome is. Um, we work with clients who face deportation proceedings. Um, some are detained in one of the largest immigration jails here in Tacoma. And some are permanent residents, so not all of our clients come to us undocumented or seeking lawful immigration status. Some are long-term community members um, with established connections and family and potentially friends um, who may be there to support. Some may be living homeless. Some may be uh, receiving mental health services. And some may have been charged with crimes. Um, and, and then we also see clients who were arrested because they were defending themselves from the abuser. And they end up being the, the ones uh, arrested. A common ch challenge, however, that we see our clients face um, who are survivors of crimes is fear. And this is, uh, generally speaking, fear of the process of the systems in, in the US, for example, um, the possibility of being deported, and, and, and fear of instability. Uh, once someone is already in, in a relationship, potentially change or um, moving the children out of the school or losing that stability that they may have is that fear. Um, I think it's a common challenge that we see. Um, but one example I like to give is of someone who, who arrived to the U.S. as a youth. Um, he came when he was a teenager um, who had suffered uh, abuse back in his home country of Honduras. And he met his spouse here in the U.S. And this is where the abuse that we talk about today um, happened in the U.S. And, and it wasn't physical violence that he suffered. It was mental health, uh, mental abuse, um, financial abuse. So that's one thing that we need to um, remember as advocates is that when we are talking with clients, that it's, there may be some fear of disclosing that may, perhaps I may have been abused, but I wasn't physically abused. And so that's one way that we are able to, to potentially um, find those um, potential reliefs for clients. Thank you. Okay. Alice, what, what, are, what about uh, the work you're doing with the International Family Justice Coalition? Um, kind of broadly, the, some of the challenges and then perhaps a specific example. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I would like to agree with uh, AP Chaya and NWERP that immigrant issues um, and violence are big concerns. Um, IFJC works with partner organizations to address these issues, uh, but as volunteer attorneys uh, who are focused on primarily divorce and custody uh, issues, um, our challenges are a little bit different. Um, the, so our focus is on uh, divorce, um, family law, domestic violence, temporary orders. The biggest challenge is domestic violence and the financial restraints um, that the divorce comes with. The spouse has little economic control um, over uh, basically anything that happens in the life as an immigrant spouse. Um, and uh, so a lot of the times that we see that this financial control is used to coerce the spouse into either signing final orders or uh, tricking her as what the real system is in place for divorce. The disadvantaged spouse cannot afford counsel uh, and does not have sufficient financial resources for themselves and any other children um, once they're cut off from the supporting spouse. And that's a big fear even um, for people that are natives and are U.S. citizens, the judicial system. Um, now imagine being an immigrant spouse who doesn't speak the language, who doesn't know what the judicial system is. That is not um, able to find counsel, and there's no one there to help her. She has, most of the time, no one to turn to. Um, there's no family or friends, because most of the time, these spouses come here, their families are back home, and not only do they not speak the language, they have no support system, because most everybody that they meet are 
they probably met through their spouse um, that's been here. And um, uh, some, so this fear of economic insecurity is a big challenge. I would like to share a personal uh, case that I've handled actually recently. Um, immigrant spouse came here, married her husband. Her husband's been a citizen for 25 years. He's also he was also Ukrainian, um, and she came here, no family, didn't speak English, uh, no support system. And shortly after their marriage, she was she uh, became pregnant, um, and so she suffered great amount of abuse during her pregnancy, um, causing her to give premature labor six weeks before the due date. And in the hospital, she was able to seek help um, and and kind of explain what's going on, and somehow she made her way and I was able to represent her. I was able to um, seek a protection order on her behalf. I was able to file for divorce. Um, right now she's safe, she's in a shelter. And um, the abuse that this woman has endured, um, both financially and physically, her husband would put her in a room and she would sleep on a mattress um, because he was telling her that she was not fulfilling her duties as a wife. Um, and But now she's safe and I was able to help her. So I was very fortunate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, uh, Alice, uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the ways in which your organization can support immigrant spouses, maybe with some other other techniques that are that you've observed at the organization? Sure, um, IFJC uh, provides low cost and free legal services to qualified spouses to assist them in obtaining divorce, uh, domestic violence protection orders, temporary maintenance, financial assistance, uh, while the divorce uh, proceeds. This can cover almost any legal issues that arise in divorce and custody mat matters. Emergency orders and temporary orders are very important because those, as I call them, are, are Band-Aid orders that basically um, will be put in place to either provide temporary maintenance for the spouse or protecting her from the violence of the spouse and kind of helping him, helping him or her throughout the way until final orders are entered. Um, and that's something that we're able to do at IFJC. Okay. And you speak uh, Russian and Ukrainian, and so that's the, your focus. Are there other lawyers who speak uh, a variety of languages to, uh, to help support immigrant spouses from all over the world? Yes. So yes. So the organization um, primarily works with volunteer attorneys and um, volunteer attorneys that are bilingual. I primarily focus on Ukrainian and Russian. We have several other attorneys that volunteer that speak other languages. Thank you. Malou, um, what are some other ways that your organization help an uh, immigrant spouse in crisis? Thank you. Um, so NERP advocates, um, I feel that when we get a client come to, to provide our, to, for us to provide the services, we, we do the best to not just look at the immigration need, legal need, um, because that's, what potentially we can help with, but we also try to partner with other organizations, um, service providers around the area where the client lives um, so that we're able to um, refer or make referrals um, around holistic needs, so housing, um, benefits, and mental health uh, services potentially. Um, so while we work on the immigration side of the case, um, we are also conscious that it's not just one issue. There's so many um, potential issues or, or legal needs that the client may be facing. Um, so connecting with other organizations. And some of our current partners like API Chaya through the VAWA unit um, already are the ones who potentially see the clients in crisis. And then when they come to NERP, we are able to facilitate the immigration need um, side of it, but still try to connect others. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Joanne, would you uh, talk about uh, your uh, API Chaya's 
work beyond what you mentioned earlier, the range of things that you do? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think about our direct services, um, last year we served 785 individuals, and so these were survivors and their loved ones. Sometimes they were caring for elders, sometimes they were caring for children, um, sometimes they were on their own. And uh, um, what we do is that we walk with survivors along their healing journey. So this can look different for each person. Um, we had a survivor last year who engaged us with um, in our leadership program, but now is seeking support group. Um, he was uh, trafficked by his partner, so he experienced um, sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking. Um, we have other folks that come to us in crisis because of you know, a hospital emergency or um, an altercation with the police where the police arrest them because of their lack of la language access. Um, and they, um, the police believe the English-speaking abusive party instead of them. Um, and so folks get referred to us in that process too and we just walk with them through their goals. Um, and each survivor that comes you know, and calls our helpline has a different set of goals, and we try to just prioritize with them and help them through that trauma and get them to a place where they're thriving and feeling really secure about their lives. And as with uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, do you have partner agencies where you help people to go to get some specific uh, service that you can't provide? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, these partners right here at the table are really so near and dear to us because the legal um, needs of our clients are so great. Um, you know, in terms of family law and immigration, those are pieces that help secure a family's foundation, that they can be with one another, that they can have safety, and that they can have economic support. Thank you. Uh, well, what can we do? as concerned citizens as, uh, or fellow residents of this area, uh, people in our neighborhood who may be going through this, or people in our circle who may be going through this, what can, what can we do? Um, you know, in the past, what we would tell people is, you know, have survivors call us. And now what we're trying to engage our communities to do is have you all support survivors directly. I think um, what the Me Too movement has shared with all of us is that there are survivors in every part of our communities, and we need everyone to step up and be a support. And for us, that looks like believing survivors. For us, that looks like as parents raising children who really care about themselves and really know that they deserve to have a healthy partnership. Um, for us, that looks like having really great male allies that's, that can see violence that's going on in our community and say, hey, that's not okay, and I'm going to stand up and be with somebody that needs support. Um, we also find that just any kind of vulnerability, poverty, um, lack of immigration status, isolation, really contributes to violence. So if you're seeing that in your communities, really fighting back against that. Um, and of course, we want your money. We're just going to say that. <laughs> So if you'd like to donate to us directly and support us um, financially or as volunteers, we absolutely welcome you. Okay, thank you. All right, how about Malu? Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I'll add Great to job. that, um, being present and, and showing up and also learning correct information around issues. Um, part of our focus areas um, includes community education, and this is to service providers, but also to community members around immigration relief and potential ways that we can support um, the immigrant community and our neighbors and family members. Um, but I think I'll echo that showing up and being present um, is important. Thank you. Um, and I would like to add to that, uh, raise awareness, seek changes in the legislation to um, improve family law in meaningful ways. Um, for instance, placing a requirement in the law that any non-native speaker must have the final orders uh, translated into their native language would really be helpful um, prior to entering the final orders because those are very hard. Once their orders are entered, there's um, very little recourse that can take place. Um, and yeah, be present. It's very important. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so in recent years, uh, many women have spoken out, and some men, about sexual violence and harassment. We explored that a year ago. Uh, to, today we've considered uh, the abuse experienced by women and men who came to America with open hearts and high hopes. We learned that some of these people uh, married to Americans lack facility with English, lack social networks, independent income, and knowledge of our legal system. 
some of these spouses are being abused and then abandoned, like uh, the lady in Saudi Arabia. We can only imagine the effect that this uh, series of traumas has on the children of these unions. Today we've learned that there are organizations and individuals, including Jiro and Malu and Joanne and Alice, who are standing up to support these vulnerable people. So what can we do? We can talk about these issues with people we know. Doing so may um, prevent abuse in our very neighborhood. If we recognize that something is awry, we can encourage the individual to seek out one of these organizations. Rotary's website and the totem will provide a set of resource links to the organizations uh, re represented by Alice, Joanne, and Malu. And it will give you uh, ways of uh, learning a little bit more about how you might assist as donors, community connectors, and volunteers. Jiro, the, the Japanese Consul General, has laser focused on these vulnerable immigrants, not just Japanese. In his 2018 op-ed piece in the Seattle Times, he refers to these immigrant spouses as victimized, vulnerable, and voiceless. He, Jiro is a steadfast advocate and protector of all the abused immigrant spouses living in our region. A link to his thoughtful article will be listed in the totem as well. I want to thank Jiro and Joanne and Malu and Alice for helping us realize that this problem does exist. Thank you all for making a difference and for your eloquence today and specificity today. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions if there are any? I have one right off the bat. Thank okay. you so much okay. for your courage. Yeah. This is important work. It seems like almost all of your clients come to you in crisis or referred from somebody or, or still in crisis. How many people are you working with at the same time in that situation? <laughs> yeah. Um, so currently I, I started at NERP um, working with specifically survivors of violence. Um, and um, now I'm, I'm not necessarily taking as many cases, but I will focus on the VAWA unit. Um, we have a wait list of 600 people waiting for an intake. Um, we have also a wait list of 300 people who have already had intakes, um, but are waiting to be assigned to an advocate. Um, and each advocate ha has a range of potentially between 50 and 150 cases. Um, so the need is there. Um, yeah. You need yeah. the lawyers in the room to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Is that what I heard? Yeah, uh, NERP also focuses on um, doing pro bono work. And so we, we would need volunteers to also, the U visas for victims of crimes, um, survivors, and then self-petitions, for example. Some of you may already be a part of our pro bono um, community, and we thank you because it's necessary. Even with all the advocates that we have as staff, it's not sufficient. But if you add pro bono community and, and partnerships around uh, across the, the state, I think we're able to address much of the need. Would either of you like to um, expand? Um, as a volunteer attorney, I'm overseeing about 20 cases um, in addition to my solo practice. So, And there's plenty of people that do need the help. Um, uh, we're always looking for volunteers. There's a lot of work out there. And then, you know, for us, we, as I was saying, we um, served 785 individuals last year, and then in our outreach and education programs reached over 12,000. Um, so what we're trying to do is both do that prevention work um, and ensure that folks that are seeking um, help are getting the help that they need. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council General, for bringing this to our attention for all the people who will never know the impact of the work that you're doing. 
Um, trust is a big issue, especially with people who are coming from foreign countries who don't trust their own government, let alone coming to our country and have questions about it. How do you overcome that or how do you build trust with these clients such that they are willing to actually engage in services to them that may be private, may be public, may be government? Um, so I guess I'll answer, I'll be the first one. Um, I'm probably a little bit more fortunate because I'm also an immigrant and I speak the language and um, I did come to this country, I wasn't born here. So right away, even though I came here when I was um, eight years old, um, I still faced some of the challenges or I watched my family face a lot of the challenges that these people are going through. Um, granted that their situation is a lot worse because they're going through abuse and um, they don't have the support system. So uh, when they enter the office, um, you know, I kind of make them feel comfortable and welcome and let them know that everything's going to be okay and that we're here to help. Um, and um, that, you know, there's, there's rainbow <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, Malu. And, yeah, so I'll add that. Um, community representation, so having advocates who look like the clients we're meeting is very important, speaking the language, so um, I agree um, that that's very important. And even if you are not representative of the community or speak the language, I think an understanding and working with survivors of violence, also uh, obtaining training ourselves as advocates to know like the different dynamics that come into play. And again, no judgment to the clients for having lived whatever experience they have. Sorry, and I would actually like to add um, the cultural background of each person that comes in through the door is very, very important. Um, that's something that uh, every attorney or the people that are helping these victims need to understand. The cultures are very different, and um, you know what's acceptable to us might not be acceptable to them, and uh, the other way around. So the cultural backgrounds, but maybe studying up a little bit on that uh, makes a big difference as well. Can you give a quick example of of a different cultural expectation that could cause a problem? Well, sure. Um, so in the Russian culture, or the Armenian culture, um, it is very common for the wife to stay at home, to kind of do all the wife duties, not to work, to raise the children, not to really have a voice. Um, for example, if the man to be the primary breadwinner and the person that's um, totally, completely um, in control of the finances. Um, and so coming here for advocates that don't know the norms, you know, some of the stories don't really make sense because a lot of women do endure the abuse because they think it's okay. You know, they think it's okay to get hit because they're not performing their cleaning duties or it's okay that, you know, if they don't get up and the baby's crying to um, have some kind of um, repercussion, but it's not. But in, in, in that culture, um, it's, it's, it's fine. So, um, and I'm sure there's lots of different cultures out there that have similarities, um, and, but that's, that's just what I've known and okay. dealt with. Thank you. Joanne, would you like to add to that or? Sure, yeah. I think mm -hmm. just on the, the question of trust, part of what we've found is um, meeting folks in their language for sure. So if we're not capable of speaking their language, making sure we have a qualified interpreter that can um, uphold confidentiality. Um, and then presenting um, folks with foods that are um, part of their culture. Um, it's very simple, but we've found that that just kind of takes an edge off and uh, helps people feel like, okay, you understand where I come from, you understand my home, um, and thank you for you know, engaging with me in this way. Thank you. Was, was there someone over here? Yes. Thank you very much, and I, my name is Velma Valoria, and we've been doing a lot of work organizing internationally, and what we have been doing is going to like the, the Philippines, India, um, British Columbia, and um, Romania, soon to Romania, to educate the women back there about what may happen to them when they get here. And specifically, and I wanted to challenge the people here, the Rotary here, we are working with the Rotary in the Philippines and they have developed a committee on human trafficking and I, uh, and I really recommend that um, the Rotary here also do the same on an international level. We can match you up with people back home. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for the coming. Thank you. Skip yes, Roland. Lillian. 
Yes, thank you, ladies, for opening our minds. You, you focused on the victims and the symptoms. What can you tell us about the perpetrators? You did mention their behavior, and their behavior is violent and antisocial. But let's talk about their thoughts. What, what kinds of thoughts are culturally driven that would put a person in a space where they would want to or feel it appropriate that they abuse someone who they say they love? Let's look at the perpetrator. What's going on in the minds of the perpetrators? Thank you. Um, I can start. So, you know, API Chaya on our um, education and community organizing side actually started a project at Monroe Prison um, just this past year. And we've been working with folks who um, have um, committed domestic violence um, and sexual abuse and other crimes against folks that were close to them. And what we found from that group is um, that they are survivors themselves, that they witnessed domestic violence growing up, um, that they experienced sexual assault growing up, um, that they believed these um, unhealthy dynamics were normal. Um, and I think we see that all over um, culturally too, that these dynamics are reinforced through the media, um, through um, parenting strategies that we haven't quite worked out how to um, you know, make more equitable um, through gender dynamics and gender roles that we're very tied to. And uh, um, part of what we see with our um, survivors and then the folks that have taken advantage of them is that sometimes just a, a change in the power um, creates a change in vulnerability. So for example, we had, um, you know, we have several clients who came from India um, and the women were professionals in India and able to um, make a wage and so were their husbands. But then when they came here through the tech companies, um, the, um, you know, one of the partners was hired by the tech company and the other came along and they were not able to work because of their visa status. And that created a dynamic in their relationship that changed the power um, and led to abuse. Thank you. Um, just, just real quick, the dynamics definitely um, come into play, but also in the immigration context, holding the immigration Last status question. as a tool of control. Um, is what we see as part of the behavior and, and the potential change that that might, might um, come, the potential change that might come about with the dynamics. I, I think it's part of what we see for abusers. Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, briefly, um, I, I just want to basically point out it's all about power. Um, whether it's from immigration status, um, job, sure anything, it's power. The, the perpetrator always has the power, and as soon as he feels that he's let it go of the power, or for example, in the times where the wife or the husband files for protection order, or files for divorce, that's the most dangerous time. Um, and that's the time that the perpetrator feels like they're losing power and a lot of things can happen. And so it's really important to have the safety mechanisms in place before, you, before the victim takes any of those steps. Um, so thank okay. you. Thank you so much to all of you. You've been very clear, and you clearly care about your work and are added a lot of value today. And thank you again to Jiro for the, your leadership in this area uh, as Consul General. Thank, uh, we are done with our program and ready for Sue.